Hi, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a chance to uh, stretch your legs, go to the loo, get a cup of coffee, all of those important things. I am going to ask our panel to switch on their cameras and join me on screen. Hi everyone. Brilliant, here we all are. So, thanks guys for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to ask you first of all just to introduce yourselves, say a little bit about what you do and where you do it. So let's start with Andrew, seeing as he's on the uh, Hi, good morning everyone. So my name's um, Andrew and I um, lead our hub in Oldham and also um, do some work across the Northwest and then one day we part of the national team thinking around community movement and how our ethos and our habits influence that um, uh, yeah our hub in Oldham we've got um, we've been kind of really active for about six years or so um, and we have um, now four academies in, in Oldham that was um, obviously one when we started um, and uh, we do a whole variety of work um, supporting those academies but also broader community work as well which we can talk about a little bit more as we go on. Brilliant. Thanks Andrew and Joe. Hi all, yeah, I'm Jo. I am hub leader in Oasis Bath and part of my role is to lead Oasis Church Bath. And uh, how long has Oasis Hub Bath existed, Jo? Um, I think officially three years, two or three years, so we're fairly fairly new. Yeah, I've been in post for two years and I think we joined probably maybe six months or so before then. So we were a, a Baptist church that then joined Oasis and became Oasis Church Bath and Oasis Hub Bath. Yeah, I'm Rebecca. I'm part of the team at Oasis Hub Waterloo and I oversee our uh, advice and food bank projects and part of the church leadership team and also just newly doing a bit of work across Oasis nationally, helping uh, other hubs support them setting up other advice and food projects. Fantastic. And Nathan. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Nathan, along with Steve, uh, we're the two ministers of Oasis Church Waterloo. Uh, also, along with Danielle, uh, we do all the community work, kind of be lead on all the community work in Waterloo as well. Um, and I'm also starting to do some work on uh, what Oasis churches might look like nationally going forward. Brilliant. So, if, you, if I look distracted at all in this, it's because I'm keeping my eye on the Q&A tab. So, um, do keep typing stuff in. We're going to try our best to pick up. Um, the themes from the questions that you're all asking. So um, I guess to begin, um, I, I think a lot of people on this call are already working in their communities or are looking particularly to um, expand what they're doing or to engage in new ways with communities. So I thought it might be helpful just to ask a little bit about kind of where do you begin when you start to think about how the church might um, be more integrated into the local community, what kind of impact you might be able to make, all the things that Steve so eloquently talked about. I think sometimes Steve makes it sound easy and it isn't easy. Um, community transformation is um, an easy thing to say, but a much harder thing to achieve. So in your experience, where have you begun? What's been helpful? Um, I might throw that to Joe to get started. Sure, yeah, yeah, maybe we're, um more more of a beginner than others having you know been quite a new oasis hub and, and beginning that journey so yeah i think that um if i'm honest i think sometimes the church can jump in too quickly sometimes and you know set up loads of stuff or think oh we could do this or we could do that and sometimes i've found what's really helpful is actually just to kind of resist that temptation and just um just do nothing just listen for a bit so uh, i find it fascinating that um, you know, for the first 30 years of Jesus's life, we know very little about what he what he did. Um, you know, that it's essentially kind of three years of, of what we would describe as doing the doing the things um, and the rest of it. He kind of was embedded in his culture. And, and I like to think that that was about sort of learning and listening and just being being around, being part of things. And so I think when when I first arrived in the role in Bath, one of the things that I said that I was really committed to doing was spending at least kind of six months just deliberately not doing anything new and listening meeting as many people as I could, meeting other community leaders, other charities, um, getting a sense from local people about what the needs were. And as you do that, 
naturally just you know things start to pop up you know you'll hear these kind of common threads and themes and um, needs start to emerge and you know relationships form as part of those conversations and you find people that are like-minded that share your values as, as an organization and want to make a difference in a similar way and you start to dream about what that might look like and I think gradually through that sort of listening and research process things just naturally kind of emerge so for anybody sort of starting out I'd say that's definitely what to do first is just to try to speak to as many people as you can form as many relationships with you can um, as you can particularly with people that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think um, I think people that think differently to you I think is a really really good thing and I think themes themes will just sort of start to emerge and I'd say definitely finally just that it's really good to, to also look at what's out there in terms of research so um like our local community foundation has um, a report called vital signs that they produce every few years and it surveys a wide range of community need and it's been a really useful resource and there's always kind of local reports and statistics and national statistics as well that give you an idea and statistics aren't everything but actually they are important and they'll help um, be a voice of, that you're kind of listening to as part of that process. Would you say someone asked earlier if there was um a kind of a, a description of a hub or resources for hubs or ideas on how to um, work within existing infrastructure of creatures and communities. Is there a blueprint for an Oasis hub and for the work that Oasis is trying to do um, in, in church and community? I'm going to ask that to Andrew, I think. Um, well, it's interesting because we're just in the process of setting up a, a, new, a new project, but it's um, it's a it's an A&E project it's not a church project so we've been asked a lot of those questions and I guess there was a little bit of apprehension around the kind of what what is a hub look like what what's the influence of church and Christ centeredness in the in the midst of that hub and I guess how we're we're describing it is um that there's not there's not a blueprint but there's a, a set of shared or, or common values things that, that that are that are really important to us so you know that the kind of stuff where we're like as Joe described, we're not trying to come in and do a quick fix so that it looks good, but we're actually trying to do something that is long term and um, that is focused on on the, the the really strong things that are present in a local community that is actually about the 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 voice and and the concerns and the challenges that that the local community face. So um and you know then we, we start to think about kind of how we do that and the the kind of sort of people that we want to be and the and the ethos we bring into that that um is kind of what is kind of the, the the baseline in terms of what actually can be involved in that it, it is really quite open and um, so yeah quite a lot of the time there is this church we have schools but that's just because that's what we have and um, it, it can be youth work it, but what what's crucial is that it's about people it's about relationship um, and it's about people finding that that god-given potential and, and being the best that they can be and we, we believe that that's the, the key to community transformation other thoughts from um so joe talked about listening and about like being aware of, of the data that's out there about your local community um forming relationships listening to other people um what else do you think is really crucial to to how you've worked and how you've um formed a sort of roadmap for what you're doing Nathan, anything um yeah, I'd say three quick things. Um, we talked a bit about earlier about starting with the low hanging fruit. So don't try and start with something that's massive and complicated and start by running a school or something. We um, we run the local food bank and um, uh, to set up a food bank, you need some scales and some shelves and somebody will be willing to give you some food. Um, it's much easier to start there than it is to start with some other projects. Um, I'd say two more things. Second would be be in the boring places. Often people say to us, the thing about Oasis is you just seem to be in the right place at the right time. And I always say, no, it's not that. It's the fact that we're in all the places all the time. So I spent an evening last week when I really didn't want to, sat on a Zoom call for two hours listening to the South Bank Forum, which is lots of people talking about planning applications and pretty boring things that's going on in our local area but we're in those meetings because through that there's a couple of things I've picked up on that might be opportunities for us so be in all the places at all the time go to the boring stuff and the last stuff is the last um, 
last thing I'd say is probably do some stuff that nobody else wants to do. So before I was part of Oasis, I was part of a church leadership team back in South Wales. And, um, and one of the things that we did is we just went to the local council and we said, we've got some volunteers. What do you want us to do? Um, and they couldn't quite believe it. And, and they were kind of asking, what do you want to get out of this? You know, do you want us to fund this or you know, why are you saying this to us? And we said, no, we've just got some volunteers we want to, to help. And so um, it turned out that they wanted to create a, a park and ride just outside the city. Um, so we just managed to get together like four or 500 volunteers from all the churches across the city. And we spent a weekend just clearing all this land so that the council could then start to park and ride on it. Now through that, we got to know the leader of the council and through that we got to know some other people and it started a relationship that's still going now. 15 years later but had we not been kind of offered our services in the first place that relationship wouldn't have started Brilliant. um there's a couple of questions around um really practical questions around volunteers um that i wanted to ask you from the um chat so someone's asked what's the um, taking the example of the library that steve talked about what's the proportion of paid staff to volunteers in a project like that and also how do you get people to commit and come along with you. Um, how do you? What's the actual practical stuff you can do to get people to catch a vision, um, and then to actually do it, commit to it, particularly on a volunteer basis? Um, but Danielle, I, 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 oh, Rebecca, you can answer about the the library. I don't know the details of that. Um, but I, I would say for us, we you know food projects is one of the main things that we do. And that's completely vol volunteer led. I had a thought about what I wanted to do. And I thought I wanted to do something around artisan food markets that, um, you know, kind of challenged the takeaway culture on the, on the road, one of the roads that we worked on. Um, but what really quickly emerged, and this is like probably six years ago before kind of even um, holiday hunger was in, in the press, is our volunteers who started to get involved knew that they, their families and their, their friends' families didn't get as much to eat during the holiday provision as they would when they were at school and so they then led something where families could come and watch a movie in one of the schools and get food and that started our um kind of food provision and, and what we were doing it wasn't what i wanted to do or what i thought was was clever in terms of a community development strategy so i think you know joe's point about in terms of volunteers being engaged and, and owning it it's about listening and being prepared to set aside our own agendas or, or clever programs but actually being around people and what people want to be about thank you rebecca you um you run a food bank and advice service the food bank especially the vibes of um i don't know 120 200 volunteers what's your experience of um of the benefits of volunteers and of managing a volunteer community yeah, absolutely. I kind of I think like Andrew said, you know, people are really willing actually and want to get stuck in with something in their community. I think people are often looking for ways to help, support, to get involved and, uh, you know, to feel like they're they're part of a community. Particularly, we've got a lot of kind of professionals who I think in some way can feel a bit disconnected from their community and actually want a way but they don't necessarily know what the avenue is to to get stuck in and get involved. So I think it's actually you know it's it's quite easy to get people involved because i think there is real willingness there uh, in most local communities and yet yeah, absolutely so our food bank uh, for, for a long time has been just me running it and yeah a team of 100 volunteers so it absolutely would would fail it would fall apart without the volunteers there and, and i think like andrew says it's sort of getting that ongoing buy-in and commitment being willing to kind of listen and adapt and shape things based on the you know, expertise and the influence of, of the volunteers who were involved. Brilliant. It's a really practical question asking what volunteer management software um, do we use? Um, I know that's a question Rebecca would love to answer. <laughs> I would. Um, so at the moment, we are just using kind of volunteer spreadsheets and systems and volunteer uh, application forms and things that we've developed ourselves but we are actually currently just exploring um, a volunteer management system called assemble uh, and that's going to kind of integrate all of those hopefully um, locally to us those kind of different bits of volunteer management dbs application forms uh, all of those kind of things so uh, if you're interested in boring volunteer management systems i'm really happy to have a further conversation with anybody about that 
brilliant. Um, this is a question in the chat, but it's one that um, someone sent in ahead of the event, actually. And um, it, I'm not sure if this panel are best qualified to answer, but we're going to have a go. And it's, if you're, um, as you're listening in, if you've got an answer to this question, then it would be really great to have that in the chat. Um, someone's asked, do you have examples of what a church can do in a small rural parish, less than 3,000 population? Um, and they're in Devon. And I know we had that question the last, we've done this event previously, and that question came up a bit. What do you do in small communities, in rural communities? It's really easy, maybe, if you're talking um, from a sort of central London location, like Rebecca said, somewhere where you've got lots of um, often young professionals with time. Um, what, what about when you feel like you're in a, um, not in such a resource rich location? So what are, the, what are the ways of working in smaller churches, smaller communities, and in rural settings? Thoughts? Um, well, Daniel, I don't have, a, obviously I work in old and I have, in a previous role, I have worked in, in Ireland in some more rural um, locations. And, but it's, uh, Oldham is definitely not, the context that we work in in Oldham is not like what Rebecca describes in Waterloo. So we don't easily find a whole host of um professional volunteers who want to, to work with us that that's a real challenge for us um, and 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 when we begun um and also we don't have a, a church congregation as such we're trying to model kind of christ-centered community in a, in a bit of a different way because there's not a an existing church there so i think again it comes it comes back to really kind of um it's it's, it's not about how many people we have or um, the numbers it's about what are the the kind of the needs and what are the the challenges and what are the the real strengths of that local community and um, and even in Oldham even though um it, you know it's 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 a big suburban part of greater Manchester actually we've got two localities because even in that one place the two localities are really really different so actually the smaller um that we can make a neighborhood focus for our, our community work actually that that's a real asset and that really helps because you're really um, engaging local people, you're really engaged in positivity, but you're really also able to meet the challenges. And um, we, we were thinking recently, um, our habit for this month is hope. Uh, and one of the things that hope does is kind of, as well as being really positive, it also questions what, what are the negatives and what are the challenges and what are the, almost the enemies to our hope. And it's um, if you've got a, a smaller kind of, more concentrated local community, then you know it's really, really easy to identify the people that are coming to challenge out the, the local enemies, and you can really, really rise up to make a, a real impact and, and make a real difference. And that can be in a, in a bigger context as part of a suburban community or in a smaller rural context. I, I think there's real opportunities there. Brilliant. Yeah, I um, as you might have guessed from the accent, I didn't exactly grow up in uh, in Waterloo, and. Um, uh, grew up in the kind of middle of nowhere and so I, th I think there are great opportunities it's just very different to what we're doing here so um, so one of the things that we always struggle with in Waterloo is that my parents church back in Wales they have people who are retired who can then volunteer their time with us we don't have anybody really who's kind of you know kind of in Waterloo and is retired and come up volunteer their time on a regular basis to us um, we don't have people who've got big houses and therefore have a spare room which they can give to a youth worker for free so they can grow their volunteer base that way by having somebody to come and work for the church and have free free board um so there's loads of different opportunities it's just a, a different way of looking at it so we run a food bank which is uh, a trust or trust food bank they also run a, a food bank it just looks very different in that context i think andrew's right it's just about working out what your resource is, what the needs are, um, which might look very different in different areas, but there's always an opportunity to um, to grow a community somehow. There are some um, there are some great answers coming in on the chat as well. So someone's listed out uh, club, Saturday big breakfast, Sunday papers and coffee, themed food and music evenings, all things that they've run successfully in a small Scottish island community. Uh, someone else making the point that rural poverty is significant and not well understood um, and actually it's a challenge in those contexts to find develop leaders and support the development of programs. Um, I don't know if anyone particularly wants to come in on that um, while you think about that. Um, as another um, comment I think it's really helpful actually it says um, I think schools are a great way in for local areas, small schools, teachers wear many hats 
and budgets are small and help is usually very welcome in rural schools, perhaps more so than in cities. So lots of good thoughts about um, spaces and places to begin, but also recognising, I think for me, one of the things that I'm always really keen when we talk about what Oasis does um, is, you know, there isn't, working in communities is, is all about small things often. It's, it's messy, um, there isn't a blueprint, there isn't a map, you don't need lots of resource. And actually the church in, most, in many places doesn't need telling that. I grew up in a, in a small community and the church, like church was engaged in every way in community life, um, staff in the local schools, um, sitting like Nate said on the boring stuff, the regeneration group on the council and, and actually just knowing the community and being the people therefore that people turn to um, when they needed um, support or someone to walk alongside them. So my hunch is churches know, you know, know how, how to do this and, and in many, you know, our, our people who've been doing this for generations and doing it well. Um, I wonder if there is a challenge for, um, for well-resourced churches to also look to um, lo local communities around them that are less well-resourced or to look at, um, yeah, I guess at, at being moving into other communities and other spaces um, where, where there's a lot of resource concentrated in one place. Um, I'm going to move us on a tiny bit and ask you a slightly different question. Um, a couple of times in the chat this has come up. Um, Oasis describes itself as Christ-centred and we also have um, churches in the mix of what we do. And there's a question for you all. Um, how do you do Christ-centred when you're working with other faith groups, with local government, with other partners? How do you do Christ-centred? Is it um, ever a barrier or are you ever in danger of keeping that identity hidden in order to work with other parts of the community? Um, Nath, I'm going to go to you first. Um, yeah, I think there's something about uh, breaking down the misconceptions of what Christianity is uh, and isn't. Um, I think Steve's example earlier of the, the minister who wanted to come in to do school assembly so that he could convert everybody. Uh, of course, that's a barrier. Of course, that's going to be a barrier to working with the local council or to working with the local imam or whatever it might be. Um, often when I have conversations, I, I think the God that you don't believe in, I don't believe in either, you know, so actually people come to me and they say, I don't believe in God because God does all these things. And I think, well, that's not actually the God that, that I believe in. Um, and so I did something about through uh, long term relationship and long term community building, you can actually show people that you aren't that kind of Christian who wants to um, run assembly so that you can convert everybody. Um, we talk about theology and ethos quite a lot. So often when we go into schools, when we take over a school, the first question that will will be asked by the teaching staff is are you just going to try and convert everybody are you going to try and make everyone a christian um and one of the things that we do quite often is we talk about we're open about the theology that inspires our ethos so we'll say we have these theological statements which will say something like we believe in a god of love god is love and god loves everybody that's the theology the ethos that comes out of that is that as a teacher in our school we believe you have to treat everybody equally and you have to show everybody who comes through those doors love now you don't have to believe in the theology of that you don't have to believe in a god at all but you do have to believe in the ethos that comes out of that theological statement um, so we talk about that and I think it's those kind of things that allow us to be open and transparent about who inspires us and where all this work comes from without necessarily giving rise to those misconceptions that mean that people don't want to work with us. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to say anything else on that one? Yeah um, I'll jump in there. I think I think we have an in interesting tension because um, we're unlike a lot of other hubs we don't have an oasis academy in bath so we're, we're known primarily as a sort of church church led hub in the sense of like we have a church and out of that church has, has come the hub or the charity that then is the kind of you know we deliver our community work sort of under that that um that banner so i think um some of those conversations have been really interesting and i think i think the way i sometimes say it is everybody has a theology you know if you say I'm an atheist or I don't believe in God that's a theology that's a theological statement so it's just being honest about that that we all have 
and at every charity, every, I mean, in Bath, there's a thriving third sector, you know, some really amazing charities, all of them on their website will have, you know, a mission statement, a vision, a, um, you know, a kind of summary of, of who they are and why they do what they do. And, and some of the terminology and the language is, it's all around ethos and values. We all do what we do from a certain set of beliefs, you know, what we think is right and and wrong, what the difference we want to make in the world. And every every kind of organization is the same. And I think when you kind of start having those sorts of conversations about actually what drives us as a charity is, you know, we're inspired by Jesus, by the life of Jesus. Um, and out of that comes this way of doing things in the same way that a, a charity might be inspired by, you know, a particular around injustice or equality, you know, that that's maybe what inspires them. So I think it's trying to just have those conversations and break down some of those myths and misconceptions about what it means to be Christ centered, to be driven by this idea of, of the life and person of Jesus and to let that kind of then, um, you know, filter down into everything that we do and the way that we do it. And actually that's nothing, that's nothing any different um, in some ways to other charities that have a certain set of values or, or beliefs from which they operate. And when you start to have those sorts of conversations, there's actually a lot of common ground then that actually we all want to see equality we all want to see people living exactly as they were made to live reaching their potential everybody kind of and once you have those conversations there's that common ground and sometimes why when it's been a barrier with us before has been over a misconception or a myth um so we just released our, our 2020 impact report which is a um, kind of 40 page report sort of measuring the difference that we've made in in Bath kind of over one particular year it's something that we, we want to do every year and Oasis UK also have a national impact report um, and somebody just picked up on there we have we've got a couple of pages on, on sort of sharing our values and there was a particular person um lovely student called Lydia who's part of our church and and she just um shares her story about uh, what it meant for her um you know being a being somewhere that accepted her for who she was um somewhere that talked openly about sexuality and inclusion and one or two people have been really surprised that you know that's kind of in there so our, our affirmation of the lgbt community because that's a, a myth or a misconception that if you're a christian you're you have these certain set of views around the lgbt community so to kind of be able to change the narrative on that then suddenly makes people go oh maybe maybe I've got them wrong actually and that's where the, the relationship can kind of begin. Brilliant thanks Joe. that's really helpful um I'm going to mention one little comment just because people are putting in examples and ideas of their own and it's I want to make sure we hear those so um coming back to the smaller communities and churches someone's advice here is choose one thing um and the example that they've given is um food saying food has always been central so a project called make lunch but I think that's great advice choose one thing find a gap that you can fill and start there um, and there another time we had someone give the example of um, breastfeeding advice um, they live working in a rural community where the midwifery service was really stretched and um, beginning from um, putting um, in sort of support and advice and um, friendship really for new parents um, and, and growing relationship from there. So, so kind of a million different ways to start, but I think that choose one thing uh, or low hanging fruit is, is great advice going forward. Um, Joe, just picking up on what you were saying, this might be a question for the rest to reflect on. I guess if you flip that, so you've talked a lot about how, um, you know, how Christ-centeredness isn't a barrier to working with people coming from different places or um, different um, faiths, different theologies, um, and that actually, also that I think really important point about inclusion um, being something that maybe people don't expect from churches and actually really really important to um, to kind of dispel that particular myth um, what the flip side of that I guess is the question to you all some some of the work you describe could be done by anybody like how is what Oasis does driven out of um, our faith and how is that accessible to people um, without, we've talked a lot about not proselytizing and not, so, so how, how do you bring those thoughts together? Um, how, is, how are we um, serving people's spiritual needs and inquiry and curiosity um, through what we're doing as well? Or, or could anyone do what, do what we're doing in Hub, set up food banks and, and projects and community development? What's distinctive do you think? For you personally about how you work i know i'm sorry it's a really hard question 
and I'm going to make Nathan start. Thanks. Um, yeah, I actually had this conversation with them. So I don't know if anyone's aware of uh, an organization called the Sunday Assembly. Um, they set themselves up as the, the atheist church. So they're based in central London. Um, and on a Sunday morning, they gather together, they sing pop songs together, and then someone talks for 20 minutes on a theme, generally often around sort of kind of social justice, those types of things. And it basically is uh, a church without God. Um, and I went there once because they did a collection for the Waterloo Food Bank many, many years ago now. Um, and ended up in a conversation with the guy who set it up. It was a guy called Sanderson Jones, I think. You think he might have been another Jones. Um, and we had a bit of this, this conversation. Um, and I, the conversation we had was around uh, what's the kind of drive behind it all. And, um, and we got talking about the Trussell Trust to the organization behind our, our food bank. Um, because that's a, a Christian organization. All Trust Trust food banks are based out of churches. Um, and I said, the thing for me is that the, it's, it's what gets me up in the morning. It's the drive behind who I am. So I am inspired. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. I am inspired by the life and example of Jesus. And that's the drive that forces me to get out of bed on a Monday morning and to go and set up a food bank and to do all the other things that I do. So I think it's the, for me, it's the, it's the drive and the inspiration behind what we do um, that's the difference, I guess. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does. And I think there's something about that, uh, our kind of beliefs that motivate and drive us, but also why we have the relational model of community and community development, that it's not about service provision or putting on a project, but actually at our core and what we think is core to our faith is a God who is love and a God who is relational and who uh, cares about people and, and therefore, you know, we care about our community first and foremost and want to see our communities as places where people thrive rather than uh, always responding to a specific issue or a specific need, although that is absolutely part of it at our core is about building relationships and building community. Brilliant. Yeah. And then, then I say for me, I think probably one of the things that I've learned on, on my journey and, uh, you know, starting in a very, um, very strong evangelical position is that I, you know, I've had to, to lay aside that other people's motivation or drivers are not, not my concern. And so when I start working in a, um, you know, a, a context where you're in partnership with statutory organizations and a whole range of partners and people come from a whole range of faith organizations, faith perspectives, and then, um, you know, that that understanding of of what community is and what love is uh, and what um, Christ centeredness is. And um, when I when I see that, you know, those moments of, of love and hope um, in our community and where, wherever they are showing themselves, I, I, I embrace that as as God at work. Um, and the, the drive and the motivation that en enables other people to be part of the God at work and the, the journey of of God in, in, in my community is, is, is just something to be embraced and encouraged. And um, there are definitely times when sometimes bringing up faith is a barrier, but then there's so many other times when it's it's an opportunity um, and, and allows us, as loads of other people have said, just to kind of change the narrative a little bit. Thanks, Andrew. That's really, really helpful. Really beautiful description. Thank you. Um, Right, I'm going to um, switch subject again a tiny bit for us. We, we labelled this conference um, Reimagine the Church Beyond COVID. And um, we haven't talked very much about COVID, which right now is unusual because most of us, most conversations centre on COVID or lockdown or when we're coming out of lockdown. And um, so just a couple of um, questions around that, I suppose. Um, the first is, um, in your experience in the work that you're currently doing, um, what are the needs that you're seeing um, in this past year and the things that you think the church needs to be prepared for in this next year? Big question. I think one of the things we've seen uh, through, we've run a food bank for a number of years and we've seen the kind of need for that increase year on year for quite a while and then really dramatically so um, as lockdown hit. And we've also seen actually that lots of other people in our community have been responding to that need. I think, you know, someone mentioned it in a church context, that food is something actually that's really easy to cling on and it's a real 
uh, tangible need in our community. Uh, and I think it's great that we're meeting that need, but I think the thing we've seen over the last year uh, and the thing moving forward is actually meeting the surface level need isn't going to create long lasting change in our community. So I think there's a couple of things with that. One is we've seen actually the importance of relationships and creating space for community as alongside meeting a practical need. So uh, we've had to switch our food bank to a delivery model and deliver food parcels rather than having people come to us and having those conversations and building those relationships and linking them in with other things in the local community. And we've seen we do follow up phone calls instead and we see through those phone calls often we're the only person that somebody has a point of connection with and actually what they really want is a space they can come and be listened to and be heard and uh, feel part of a community and feel a sense of belonging so I think uh, creating spaces where people feel that they can belong and be listened to um, is going to be key and then I think on the more kind of practical side of things as well as meeting the immediate need there's a real uh, need for us to be thinking bigger and to be thinking how do we respond to the root causes of those needs in our community so we often talk about food poverty but actually uh, hunger or needing food is just a symptom of of a wider cause of of poverty uh, so I think there's a need to get involved in we've talked again about the boring stuff but like getting involved in local councils in local politics in national campaigning. And I think there's a real role for the church to step up and to say, we don't just wanna to respond to this need. We don't just want to provide food parcels forever and ever, but we actually want to see, uh, Trussell Trust talk about seeing an end to the need for food banks. But I think in sort of any of our food provision, we'd love to close our doors. I'd love to not be doing the job I'm doing. And so how do we work to see justice in our communities? And uh, yeah, to to see real change rather than just meeting need. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's um there's also something about mental health as well. Um we've all seen the stats which say that there's you know the increase in, in poor mental health in, in teenagers who haven't been able to go to school, in parents who have been homeschooling, in people who live on their own who have been isolated. You know, there, there's been a lot written about that in the last year. And um and I think you know on top of that we have over a hundred thousand people who have died of COVID on in the last year, and there's there's a lot of grief. There's going to be a lot of grief, and I think a church community which can say, "We are here for you and we love you," will be hugely important coming out of the back of this. Um, so I wonder whether it's something about how we can open our doors so that people can tell their story, and be listened to, be really heard. Um, not, not a church that tries to fix all their problems and tell them that Jesus will make all these problems go away, but a church that offers genuine compassion through this and helps people to work back towards somewhere where they might have been. Yeah, Danielle, I, obviously I agree with both, I've seen both what Rebecca and Nathan are talking about for us. Another thing that we really have observed um, is just the kind of um, breakdowns in, in relationships and the fear that exists within different community groups. So. Oldham has a as a has a history of, of segregated societies um, and and communities and loads of work is, is has been done on that and I I see this kind of the isolation and the fear and the mist lack of trust that's happened who's broke the the COVID rules who's brought the the the, the spike blame culture that started to exist people who've been um in their houses for a long period of time and haven't uh, um been engaging with people who come from different backgrounds themselves that all that kind of good work that's been done is kind of I'm I'm really anxious about how that's going to um, play out over the next couple of months and I think again for for churches um, and for embracing a theology of inclusion there's a massive opportunity to be to be people of hope be people of relationship be people who say um, you know there is we can create unity and we can create positive relationships across lots of different um, kind of sections and, and people groups within our communities so there's a real need and opportunity there. I think um, there's something, you know, thinking more about and I like, agree with all of that um, as a as a sort of, you know, the church leader part of me, um, you know, has been thinking a lot about, you know, OK, church, like the kind of more of this sort of Sunday stuff and what that's going to look like. And I think that's a really interesting. I think what this has done is perhaps maybe open up people to the possibility of 
of kind of a bit more variety within church and what church can look like um so kind of you know everybody's had to sort of adapt to, to the online stuff to uh, we're doing like a hybrid service where you can come to the church um, we haven't actually done it the last couple of months because of the restrictions but um you know you can come along or you can watch the same version of a, a service a pre-recorded version online at the same time and I think that's been really interesting just that people's comments from that in terms of it it, it making us more inclusive just by uh, not being on a Sunday morning so people that work on Sundays people that um, you know are juggling different responsibilities that can't come to a church on a, a Sunday maybe people that have got accessibility issues that sort of stuff it's it's made church more accessible and I think everybody's I mean, I've seen that in a bunch of different places kind of you know more people joining in or exploring church so I think there's perhaps a challenge you know how we go forward with that so as Oasis we've been doing these weekly global gatherings every every Sunday at 11 o'clock um poor old Nathan <laughs> ed editing them every week <laughs> um but that's been incredible in terms of just opening out uh, opening the doors really in a way I mean our doors were always open but I think I, we've been able to open this other set of virtual doors so that people have been able to kind of join in and be part of of what we do even if they live nowhere near an oasis hub or so I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge going forward because we can't just go back you know this sort of back to normal or you know there, there is no back to normal we can only go forward and I think learning some of the challenge you know some of the the lessons from COVID in terms of just being more diverse as a as a gathered church community, I think there's a lot of um, a lot more conversations that we need to have about what that's going to look like as we kind of emerge out of the restrictions and and go forward with with our sort of church gatherings. Thank you. Are there things that um, this last year you think has taught you, changed your view about in terms of the the work that you're doing, or kind of challenged you personally and these are questions you weren't, I didn't know I was going to ask you, so that's quite a big question. Um, why don't I answer to start while you think about it? I suppose um, something that Rebecca said, I think I've, I've been reflected on a, on a huge amount that COVID has pushed us. And I think I, from, from looking around, pushed a lot of people into kind of emergency response mode. So a lot of our work has become like, what are the greatest needs and, and what can we do to help? And I wonder how we'll emerge from that as a community for two reasons. I think one is um, that if we're not careful, it feeds the ego of we are able to, we are here to, to help everyone and rescue everybody. And I, it, it, you know, I constantly remind myself that we, we are part of communities with a huge number of strengths and assets and that we are, um, you know, in the, in the reality of what's happened in the last year or so, it's very easy to label communities or parts of com communities as disadvantaged or um, in need. And whereas people are, the reality is people are facing what are structural disadvantages um, and poverty that is grinding. Um, and, but, um, but we, I suppose for me and my work, I'm thinking all the time, how can we make sure that we're not overriding people's agency and also that we're just not getting ourselves into a place where we think our job is simply to be responding to emergency need as opposed to building community which is something very different um, from just providing crisis support and I, I'm always saying it's both and because um, there are people on our doorsteps and, and living um, alongside us and some of us as well who are in genuine um, need that needs a response. Um, and it's not good enough to say, well, you know, we're working on a community asset strategy and um, we're not interested in your immediate need. But yeah, that I think that's gonna be a challenge for, for all of us um, and probably an opportunity to get to know our communities um, and to, to invite people um, further into relationship and, and not to see ourselves just as an emergency service. Um, which is, um, which is, you know, maybe something that we've been pushed into in the past year. Yeah, and Danielle, I would say kind of alongside that, I'd also say the importance of, of charitable groups or, or, or any, any group remaining local and remaining adaptive. So like for our community and especially in the first lockdown, 
statutory services almost completely disappeared, access to employability services, access to advice and, and benefits completely disappeared. And we'd loads of families with very little English new to the country who had nowhere to go. And so loads of, it was just like a, it was a desert um, for people who normally had support structures in place. So I think for us, it's really, um, yeah, clar clarify the importance of, first of all, the long haul stuff that we're, if we're in this, we're in this for the long haul. And when, when things go really badly wrong, we're still there. And when things are amazing, we're still there. Um, but also being ready to adapt quickly um, and, and be responsive. And again, I, I, exactly just as you said, the absolute importance of the voice of the local community. So that even once you adapt, that you then readapt when we come out of it and just being able to respond to change, which is really tiring um, and, and really hard and definitely takes its toll. Um, so making sure that you've got support and you're kind to yourself in the midst of that, but being able to do that is definitely something that, and I, I, and I think local churches are absolutely, you know, absolutely best place to do that because they're there and ready to, to adapt and change to the needs of their local community. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Great. Um, again, really interested in the chat. Um, if you've got any responses to some of the questions I'm asking uh, the panel, um, it's a really great opportunity to hear from um, all of us in very different um, perspectives and different situations. So, um, Annoyingly, the um, Q&A function on a Zoom webinar doesn't organise the questions in order of that they come in. So I'm scrolling up and down and trying to catch what you're saying to us. But thank you for all the questions and for the comments and the input. It's really, really helpful. Um, there are a couple of questions um, asking a little bit about um, what role Oasis might play um, more widely in the church, or I think asking questions about have we got kind of plans um, to resource other churches um, or to um, for leadership development or for partnerships or you know how do oasis hubs get formed um, and those sorts of questions um nath you mentioned earlier that you're working a little bit about um, thinking about church network is that this is a good moment to talk about that yeah absolutely um yeah so as joe said uh, oasis church bath was a uh, a Baptist church that um, that got involved a couple of years ago, and that was the um, the start of something really. I think we probably Steve and I used to run a a conference back in the olden days where people could actually gather together um, in Waterloo called Active Church, where we would encourage church leaders to come to see us in Waterloo. We'd spend a day with them talking about how we can do church and community and show them around some of the stuff that we're doing in Waterloo. And out of the back of that, um, somebody from the team in Bath came down to see us and then started that conversation. So that was one way in for us was uh, a, a church that was already organised, already gathered, already had a a building and a community and a congregation and everything becoming more part of the uh, the oasis network um we've also had similar conversations now with a, another church in hull that um uh, that are looking to do a, a similar thing but beyond that i think what one of the the benefits of the online thing is that it has been an opportunity for us to to gather some people together from places that aren't just waterloo or bath so um we started a, a book club um this week uh, reading Brian McLaren's new book together and we had about um, about 80 people have signed up for that of which about 30 are part of the churches in Waterloo or Bath and everybody else is, is somewhere else in the country who's not near a church in Bath, not in Bath or Waterloo and I get asked the question all the time is there an Oasis church in um, somewhere and so we're just starting to do a bit of work now on what that might look like for individuals who want to kind of gather together as a community online around a kind of more progressive theology the, the theology that Steve was talking about earlier uh, one that's kind of really intrinsically linked with social justice so there's there's, there's that online community there of which this is about a part I guess but also there's definitely an opportunity that we've probably not really been able to resource previously of if there are established churches around the country that want to become part of an oasis network um, then we're definitely up for having a conversation about what that might look like I guess. Brilliant I think you can contact Nathan via the um, Oasis Waterloo Facebook page is probably the easiest thing or the website you want to carry on that conversation but I've got two more really practical quick questions for you and then we're going to hand back over to Steve so the first one is around funding um, so we've talked about loads of different projects and um, lots of different types of work that we do um, from each of you just really quickly um, 
what are how are how is your work funded um where are the places that you look to for funding any tips for people um well so for us in oldham our work is still mostly grant funded we'd love to move beyond that into something that is is more long term and that's constantly our aspiration to have a better income generation plan we did have some social enterprise and local generated income before covid that stopped um, and so for this year it is literally small pot by small pot um, I, and I, but i think the key for us is that um it's relationship again so we have some local housing providers who want to to meet some social targets and we can provide that for them. We can do what they they can't do. Um, so relationship and a little bit of hard work is is how it is at the minute, unfortunately. I'd love there to be a better answer than that, but there's not. <laughs> Anyone else? Any top tips for funding? Um, I'll let Rebecca talk about the kind of project specific wider community work that we uh, that we get funded for. But I think the, the benefit of, of Waterloo is that because we have this church community, we have a regular income which we can rely on. So we have people who come to the church who give standing orders to the church every month. And so we know that we've got a kind of core base of some kind of funding coming in. It's not uh, by any stretch enough, it's probably about 10% of what we need to run all the community work that we do in, in Waterloo, but we know that there is that core work there, that core funding that we can rely on. And I'll ask Rebecca to talk about the rest of the stuff. Yeah, I suppose similarly to Andrew, there's uh, lots of it's through grant funding and just sort of hard graft, looking out different funders and, and submitting uh, funding application bids. And we do also run some kind of income generation uh, bits of our work through sort of hiring out venues obviously that's been a bit more challenging in the last year uh, and through our uh, coffee shop which is designed to uh, invest any profit it makes back into the work that we're doing uh, and then I suppose the other thing is uh, making use of corporate donations so we try and connect as much as possible with uh, local businesses and uh, businesses who are based in our area and see if they'll either support us on a kind of ongoing corporate partnership basis or uh, on a sort of one-off and, and that might vary again I guess going back to sort of rural communities and things like that those kind of sources might not be so widely available but there will be sort of local businesses and things in your area that might want to support their community. Yeah and similarly kind of a mixed bag for us so yeah again we a, a lot of our church community give through standing order and that's always the best way because it's a kind of unreserved and you can distribute that as, as needed and then some of our more community focused stuff is funded by a range of grants and trusts most of which are just small pots so yeah it is a bit kind of year to year um, as is the way of the third sector normally um, and we also have a church building that we are kind of hoping to develop more of a vision around uh, refurbishing but we have lots of different partnerships with various community groups and other charities that use those spaces and that's starting to now um, provide some income for the other work that we do and then just whatever and whenever live people are sometimes people will do fundraising things for us you know sponsored events or individual you know kind of sign up their em employees uh, to be our you know we're like a charity of the month or so just from wherever we will we will take money but yeah that's kind of a mixed model really brilliant thank you and one last question possibly a practical one possibly a philosophical one you could take it as you may um but kind of coming back to where steve started us off talking about kind of our vision for shalom um and for the um the whole of a person in a community's life um experiencing the kingdom of god um how on earth do you measure success? What does success look like? Maybe that's not a question we often ask in churches, maybe in often our measure of success in the past has been how many people turn up on a Sunday morning, but what for you does success look like? I remember um, somebody saying recently that, I can't remember who it was now, I'm just gonna steal this quote from somebody unknown, apologies if you're out there, um, but it was something like churches should measure success by how many people have a voice and that really sort of struck me. Um, and I think it's kind of influenced my approach. I think previously I would have probably said more about, you know, measurable outcomes and how many people had, you know, the, the kind of stats and facts and figures. And, and more recently, you know, I kind of like that in terms of, you know, how many people are empowered, how many people genuinely have a voice and can express, 
you know their experiences and that we are responsive to those and that it's kind of this shared thing rather than a sort of top down you know um service delivery sort of model so I think that's sometimes how I measure success um I think for me it's probably somebody taking taking one small step towards wholeness so this idea of shalom or you know like and it's it's often not measurable is it? it's just those little moments um uh, so we we run a food pantry uh every week and we've had a member uh, who came to us through a domestic violence service they were in a domestic violence refuge and um they kind of phoned up the other day to say oh i'm not I'm not coming in anymore because i've been given some accommodation so i'm sort of moving on and it was just this really like lovely moment of you know like and you know lots of that has been the wraparound services that that been, have been provided to her but through that engagement she's kind of moved into a home and you know she's starting a life again and she's you know again you can just see her taking that little step towards but she knows that we're kind of there for as long as, as she you know as she needs us so I think it's just sometimes those little moments um of just watching somebody take a step more towards that and sometimes that's just the teeny tiniest thing that it's almost like a feeling or a word or a sentence that you can't necessarily write it in a shiny impact report or tell people about it but I think that's that's our kingdom isn't it that like these these little things of success can just be like the mustard seeds and the the tiny little moments that then will grow into something big that sometimes you don't always see thanks Jo anyone else I had um, someone who walked past the other day. Uh, we were running our pantry, so our, uh, we've just started a little pantry and it was open. Uh, and that guy walked through the door and we'd helped him out with some uh, benefit stuff and some form filling. He struggles a bit with his literacy. And he, he walked in and he just wanted to say, he said, I don't have any problems anymore. I don't need anything anymore that he still wanted to pop in and I am absolutely sure that every time he walks past he lives locally to us he's going to pop in and he's going to want to be involved with what we're doing so I think for me it's kind of similar that he has found a sense of belonging in the community where he previously felt quite isolated and lonely so he said you know I don't have any practical needs anymore but I still want in I still want to be part of what you're doing. I think that might be a nice note on which to end. Thank you so much, um, the four of you, for your time, for your wisdom. And um, also just love listening, not just to your kind of practical um, answers, but to something of your heart in what you do. So thank you. And thank you for being willing to be a part this morning. And we are going to hand back over to Steve for our final session. <laughs>